Okay, guys, so um, I want to do something quite quick with you today. We're going to start off, I'm just going to quickly talk to you a little bit about potentials. And uh, we'll talk about uh, po the potentials that we need for magnetostatics. Once we finish discussing potentials, then you will build a motor with Nerina. Okay, so let's discuss potentials now. And um, then we'll build the motors and then you can work on your assignments. Okay, good. Now, uh, so let's uh, see. If we think about um, the electrostatics, can somebody tell me the equations that we had introduced for the electric field? So the divergence of the electric field, what's that equal to? Good. How about the curl of the electric field? Zero. Good. Now when we introduced a potential, we said the electric field is equal to minus the gradient of the potential. This equation here, in arguing that the electric field was minus the gradient of the potential, which of these equations were we using? The curl. So it was very important that the curl was zero. So it is because the curl is zero that we could introduce a potential. And any function that can be written as the gradient of a scape potential will automatically have a zero curl. Okay? So that was the that was the important equation. What are the equations for magnetostatics? Good, divergence of B is zero and curl of B is U naught current density. Good. Now the curl is not zero. Can we introduce a potential? Well, clearly, it will not be the divergence of something. But now, the equation that plays an important role is not the equation for the curl, but rather the equation for the divergence. And if you, if you are told that the divergence of a vector field is zero, you know immediately that that vector field can be written as the curl of something. So we write that the magnetic field is equal to the curl of A. And the equation that's playing a role now is the one that tells us about the divergence of B. Okay? So we don't introduce a scalar potential. We introduce a vector potential. So this is a vector potential. Now, our scalar potential was arbitrary. It had a certain arbitrariness. And the arbitrariness that it had is that we could always add or subtract a constant. Okay? So if you have got V and you add A to it, if you calculate minus the gradient of the potential plus a constant, you get the same electric field. So electric potential is only defined up to a constant. There's an arbitrariness. In the same way, the vector potential is also arbitrary. But there's a much bigger arbitrariness. You see, if I take some vector potential, A, and I add to it the gradient of any function f, and I calculate the curl. What did we say that the curl of a gradient was? Zero. So this will be the curl of a plus the curl of a gradient 
but that vanishes. So this is just the curl of A. So if you give me one potential A, I can write a second potential, A plus the gradient of a function, and this will give me the same magnetic field. So the potential, the electric potential, is arbitrary because it can add a constant, and that's an arbitrariness. The vector potential has a much bigger arbitrariness. I can add the gradient of a function to it. That's a much bigger freedom. Okay? So I can add an arbitrary function. Is everybody happy with that idea? What we're going to see soon, okay, uh, next week, we will actually talk about this arbitrariness, talk about the full version of it, and, and, and this is the first hint that you're seeing of gauge symmetry. All of the forces that we have in modern physics all enjoy a gauge symmetry. And one of the ways of writing down the laws of particle physics is just to say what that gauge symmetry is. So nowadays, we don't even think in terms of the uh, fields like E and B and things like that, we think in terms of the symmetries. And the symmetries are in fact the thing that is fundamental. Okay? And we're seeing the first hint of those symmetries here. Next week we'll develop that idea further. Good. Now, you might say, well, we didn't gain anything because we had a vector field and now we've traded it for another vector field. So you might say, well, we didn't gain anything by, by doing this. Previously, we traded the electric field, which was a vector field, so three functions at each point in space, for a single scalar field. So that looked like a good trade. Here it looks like we've traded a vector for a vector. Well, the first thing is, we don't have to worry about this equation anymore. That equation is automatically solved. So the only equation we have to worry about solving is this equation. What is this equation called? Ampere's law. So the only thing we have to worry about now is solving Ampere's law. So what I would like to do is, I would like to rewrite this equation for the vector potential now. Okay? So let's do that. What if we write down Ampere's law, substituting in that B is the curl of A, what equation do we get for A? There's Ampere's law. What we want to calculate now is the curl of the curl of A. Now, there's a formula that we use for cross products. So if I want to calculate A cross B cross C, can anyone tell me what this is equal to? Back cab rule, good. Have you guys heard of the back cab rule? So you write, this is the name of it. Back cab rule. Okay? All you have to remember is that name. How the back cab rule works is, you take this quantity and you write down back cab. Now you make everything a vector. And now you put in a dot product. And that's the answer for the back cab rule. Let me just make sure I put the dot in the right place. Oh, I put the dot in the wrong place. That's the answer for that cross product. You can write it out 
in terms of determinants, if you want, and check is this really true, okay? That is the formula for um, A cross B cross C, and we will use that now freely, okay? So, using the back cab rule, will you guys please write down what is the curl of the curl of A? Now, when you use this formula, you're allowed to put A dot C on this side of B or on that side of B. It doesn't matter, because it's just a number multiplying a vector. The same for A dot B. It can go this side of C or that side of C. It doesn't matter. However, when you start applying it to these vector operators, these derivatives always have to act on A. So make sure that you've always got these derivatives acting on A. So try and see if you can uh, write down what is the answer. Okay, guys, you've had a chance to take a look, so let's do this together. So the three vectors are A, B, C. So A is nabla, B is nabla, and C is our vector potential. So what we have here is B and A dot C. So A dot C is the divergence of A. And then it's B multiplied into A dot C. And B is nabla. So this is the gradient of A divergence. Minus, then we have A dot B. A is nabla, B is nabla. The Laplacian, good. And C. And C is the vector potential. So I'm going to put C this side because I know that both derivatives act on A. Everyone happy with that? Good. Now, so this equation doesn't look particularly simple, but there is something we can do. Let's say I give you an A. So you are, um, you are given A. Okay. Now you know that this A that I give you is not unique. Okay? An equally good A is A plus the gradient of some function that I called chi. So instead of working with A, I'm going to work with A plus the divergence of chi. And that will give me the same magnetic field. So it's equally good as a potential. Everybody happy with that idea? But now you say to me, what is chi? This is how I will choose chi. I will choose chi so that, so let's call this A prime, the divergence of A prime my new vector potential, which is nothing but the divergence of A plus the Laplacian acting on chi, I will choose that to be equal to zero. This equation is now an equation that I can solve to get hold of chi. 
So you give me any potential at all, any vector potential. I know I can always trade for a new potential, A prime, which is A plus the gradient of chi, and then I will choose chi so that the divergence of my potential is zero. By that argument, what can I always assume? The divergence of my potential vanishes because I can always change it so that the divergence vanishes. Everyone happy with that? But if the divergence vanishes, that term is zero. So I can always make that choice. So what does Ampere's law become? It becomes minus the Laplacian acting on A is equal to mu naught J. Let's write out some of the components to make it completely explicit. We've got minus the Laplacian acting on the x component of A is equal to mu naught times by the x component of the current density minus the Laplacian acting on the y component of A is mu naught times the y component of the current density and minus the Laplacian acting on AZ is equal to mu naught times the current density. So we've reduced the equation that we have to solve to having to solve something that looks like Poisson's equation, right? Laplacian on something equals some source term. And this now looks very, very similar to the equation that we had to solve for the, for the electric potential. For the electric potential, we had Laplacian of V is equal to minus rho over epsilon naught. So the advantage of introducing the vector potential is that now we only ever need to solve Poisson's equation. We're always studying the same equation, it's the same equation to solve to get hold of the electric potential, it's the same equation to solve to get hold of the vector potential. That's a benefit. There's only one kind of equation to solve now. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about potentials. So are there any questions on potentials at this point? Yes, Thomas? You mean uh, for this? Okay, so I didn't give explicitly the argument for this, but let me uh, um, remind you of how we got that. Um, what we said was, we know that What's that called? The, the differential form of the gas law, absolutely. So take that and the electric field is minus the gradient of V. Plug this into the differential form of the gas law and you'll learn that minus the Laplacian of V is rho over epsilon naught, which is that equation for the electric potential. So all of the potentials that we have to solve for obey the same equation. And sometimes you have a current source, sometimes your source is the charge density. Good. Any questions, guys? The divergence of A is going to zero. If, for example, if we say I choose a, like a magnet where like uh, some arbitrariness and chi does not go zero, then that means that the divergence is going to be zero. Okay, so the divergence of A equal to naught is a choice that we've made. It's called making a choice of a gauge. <coughs> and what you can ask yourself is if you take the full set of solutions of electromagnetism, every single vector potential that you find, could you write them all in a form 
so that the divergence of A is equal to zero. Is that the question that you're asking? Okay. I don't know if that's been proved by anyone, but we certainly always assume that that is the case. So we, we assume you can always write the divergence of A is equal to zero. For electromagnetism, I think it would be very easy to prove. But for other theories, where, which we'll talk about next week, for gauge theories, we also assume that that's possible. And in those cases, it hasn't been proved and um, might not quite be true. There might be some configurations for which you can't write the divergence of A is equal to zero everywhere. Does that, does that answer your question? Good. Any other questions? Okay, good guys. So now we'll build the motors with Nerina. And um, then you will have time to work on your assignments. Okay? So maybe we should gather around the back. Nerina will show us the motor. I need to give it. Yeah, almost there. See? <laughs> That's the motor. And that is electromagnetism. <laughs> yeah. Still. Are you happy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's your turn to build your own motor. Yeah. So, okay. So I want to show you how to build this uh, coil. So I've got already those wire. I have already cut the precise length of those side, uh, wire. So the, this legs, this one legs is roughly the size of your thumb. So I'm gonna grab this and press this like this. See? Then and wind it one turn two turn, then in the halfway, and roughly having the same length of the legs, the over leg. So that is how to build the, this uh, coil. Okay, release it, and then try to adjust it like this. And then you need roughly to look at, are these legs are aligned perfectly? So just try to rotate it, and if you just see there is no distortion in the, this circle, so it is roughly, can you see it? It is roughly aligned. So what we're gonna do next is we need to remove in the same side the insulation. Ever you can remove this side or this side, but before we do that, this is what I noted during the experiment. Let, let me just balance it. So, balance it over there. Okay, we're going to remove that side. Okay. So, we're going to remove the insulation in that side. You need to remove this with the scissors. It's not all of it, but if you just think of this is the wire, remove this part. Not all of it, that's it. Okay guys, that's the most important piece. Yeah. When that coil is vertical, remove the insulation at the bottom of each piece of wire. If you remove the insulation all around the wire, I guarantee you your motor won't work. Exactly. That is for that first leg. Okay, I need to make some adjustments because, okay, it must work perfectly. If this won't work, 
I've got all this already. <laughs> but I believe that this one will work perfectly. Okay, perhaps we are running out of the power. Oh, almost there. Here it is. See? Now we are running out of the power. So we've got batteries over here, scissors. I've already cut those. It's your turn. 